to the stage, creates and draws a rectangle and a circle to the stage, and centers them based on the height and width of the stage. Those are those X position and Y position values I was discussing earlier. In addition, a rectangle object is created to contain the sliding circle. Now, this is confusing because it's not really a shape you can see, it's just an invisible boundary, kind of like an imaginary box. You can see here we've created a couple sprites, sprite equal to new sprite, and uh, we'll set the positioning of them, and then slider, which is our second sprite, that ball, equal to a new sprite, where we specify the color, its X position, and its Y position. In addition to adding it to the stage, we also add an event listener, where when the user clicks the mouse down, uh, we're gonna fire off the drag slider function. That's gonna be our event listener and our, our handler. Drag slider is going to be our event handler. We're also going to add an enter on a mouse up event to the actual stage. So when the user has released the ball, the stage is going to be listening uh, for that and then run the stop slider function accordingly, which will stop the slider. And then boundary, last but not least, boundary is going to be set equal to a new rectangle object with a couple parameters passed. We've got its x value, its y value, uh, and um, its, its width and its height. Uh, basically, what we've got here is we've set the value to negative 100. Uh, we've set it to negative 100 because it's added relative to our sprite. You can see I'm kind of reading off the heavily commented code, but it's, it's pretty important you understand this because if you were to set the, um, the uh, X position of the rectangle at zero, you'd get some pretty funky effects. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that and test that now to see what exactly I'm discussing because if you look right here, we've basically set the, um, the uh, actual rectangle that we've drawn to the stage equal, I mean, excuse me, we've set the width of the rectangle that we've drawn to the stage, the actual shape, not the boundary, equal to 200. So we'll, we'll minus 100, so it equals half. And basically, if we set it to zero, what you've got is, well, excuse me, give me one second. Let me save that. If we, if we set it at zero, the slider just goes completely off the rectangle. Because we've got it set equal to the uh, stage's width divided by two, it's going to be added relative to the sprite. So we need to be using negative 100 to um, set the position of that ball, set the boundaries of that ball accordingly. So change that back to negative 100, and you should have a, a working slider, one that stays contained within the uh, confines of the rectangle we've actually drawn to the stage, one that mimics the rectangle we've drawn. Even though it's invisible, it's exactly, exactly perfect, um, uh, at least on the x-axis, com compared to this rectangle, this gray rectangle that we've drawn to the stage. Now let's talk about our first event handler, which is drag slider, which we've added to the slider object. That's our little ball. Uh, <clears throat> basically when the drag slider function is called, it's listening for a mouse event, so when the user clicks down, it runs. Slider dot start drag, the, uh, the start drag method of the sprite, of the sprite class, which uh, in this case represents our slider object, that little ball. Uh, first, we're going to specify false, uh, that's the lock to center property of the start drag method. And then boundary, uh, which is going to be that rectangle we created, those invisible walls we specified, uh, the limitations of how far this ball is draggable. And then, because we don't need the, um, the, event, the event listener anymore, we're gonna go ahead and remove it. So we specify that on the second line within the function. Next, we're gonna add, we're gonna add a new event listener because once we start dragging the, um, the, uh, the ball, we want the volume to change directly, uh, directly with the ball's x value. And we're gonna specify that through the enter frame event. Um, so stay slider.addEventListener event.enterFrame and then run the change volume function per frame. Now that second event handler, stop slider, uh, that we've added to the stage, on mouse up we want stop slider to stop dragging the ball because if the user is no longer clicking there's there's no point in dragging. So as soon as the user uh, uh, stops clicking on the mouse, run the stop drag method on the slider object. We don't need that event listener anymore so we're going to remove it as well. Now lastly let's discuss this um, uh, this enter frame event that's been added to the slider object, change volume 
runs per frame on the slider object so long as we're in the dry, track slider function. I know it sounds confusing, but it's really not. If you've copied and pasted the code, you can follow it directly and hopefully get a better understanding of what exactly it does. Now the change volume function is very, very, very simple. Uh, per frame, the change volume function will run, and this function is constantly recalculating the volume variable that we had created at the, uh, the top of our class right here public var volume number and in the very first function we set it at 50% because we wanted to correspond directly with its x value on the stage the sliders x value that sprite and basically we've got this math formula here where we take volume and we set it equal to 0.5 which is its current its current position its current number and then we add a rounding of the sliders x position divided by the length of the rectangle rectangle it rests upon so uh, basically when we test the movie relative to the size of the rectangle uh, the, the ball's volume will change now you can trace these values and you will see that they start at 0.5 they go from 0.5 to 1 if you're increasing the volume all the way back down to 0 and last but not least this is the most important step we need to set the new channel volume equal to the new channel volume so we set channel access the sound transform property which is located right here and we set it equal to a new sound transform volume object a uh, new sound transform object where volume is passed within the parentheses that new volume we've recalculated per frame so no matter what when you test the movie if you increase the volume the volume increases if you decrease the volume the volume decreases the ball stays locked within its invisible boundaries that we specified and you've got, a, got yourself a volume slider. Thank you, I have enjoyed this tutorial. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section. I'll try to answer them the best that I can, and good day.